good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Carrie Thomas Whiteside. I am from um, Erie Community College, and I'll be moderating today's session, which is the Empire State Immersive Experience Project, also known as EASY, Capturing Reality at Your Library. Our hosts for today are uh, Joe Riggi from Buffalo State College. Joe is the head of information management at Buffalo State, where he manages library systems, e-resources, and library acquisitions. He holds a master's in library science from the University of Buffalo. He loves science fiction, fantasy football, and sleep when he can get it. Uh, Ken Fujiuchi is also at Buffalo State. He is the emergency technology librarian at the E.H. Butler Library. He holds a master's in library science from the University of Buffalo. His research interests include information literacy, extended reality, social media, linked data, and other emerging technologies. Um, a quick note of um, housekeeping real quick is that everyone is muted right now. When we get to the discussion, you are welcome to raise your hand and I can unmute you at this time, at that time. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature versus the chat feature to ask any questions. And I think we're going to get started with uh, Joe or Ken. Joe, one of you are going to go first. Hi, this is Ken speaking. And I apologize if you hear any kids running by or you know Pokemon names are being called. But um, that's part of working from home. Um, I just want to go over a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. We, we're breaking it down this presentation into three parts. Part one is just talking about extended reality, basically just to make sure everybody understands a lot of the lingo we're going to be using and kind of talk about how librarians and libraries can play a role in this new kind of emerging technology. Part two is going to be more focused on a specific project that we're working with. Um, we're collaborating with WinnieLurk and WinnieLurk members to basically design the Empire State Immersive Experience Project, Easy Project, as well as an Easy Repository, Demo of Easy Space. And then at, we'll kind of walk you through what that looks like at this point, uh, but it is still in development. So I would say it, it's probably in our beta phase and we'll, we'll start to look for people to see if they want to collaborate as well. Um, and part three will just be uh, showing you some more examples of what's to come in this technology and area and basically open it up to discussion. I think a lot of times people have a lot of questions about this new technology and we want to give a, a lot of time to let people kind of bring them up. Okay. Now, to start off, uh, I'm going to try to explain extended reality. Um, but first, I think we're going to talk about virtual reality. It's basically when people talk about virtual reality, it's computer generated, it's controlled environment, and it's usually an immersive sort of setting, whether it's goggles or a full on room. Uh, the idea is that you're virtually placing yourself into a simulation of some sort to create a sense of, you know, reality that's, you know, separate from your actual reality. Um, another term you probably heard is augmented reality. That you might hear when you're shopping on Ikea's app on your phone and things like that, or nowadays even Home Depot, and most recently even Etsy has uh, added this feature. But basically the idea is that it's, it's trying to combine digital content with a live physical view. And basically overlaying sensory information, which in, it basically just means that you, know, it, you can see the real world through your either a camera at this point or some glasses um, and that there's like a screen built into the screen where it allows you to sort of display data or objects or three-dimensional digital objects. A lot of times you might see the Pokemon Go as an example where people are walking around and you know catching Pokemon um, as well as like being able to lay out Ikea furniture or things like that in your physical space in where it actually would be. Um, in a lot of ways it's it's more approachable, but a lot of times people forget that that's part of the sort of virtual reality, uh, extended reality technology. And then finally, so a term that's kind of popped out recently is mixed reality. I think Microsoft started to make it a little bit more popular. Uh, but the idea is that there's sort of this intersect between virtual reality and um, augmented reality, where uh, a lot of technologies are starting to move towards 
sort of blending the different aspects of virtual reality and augmented reality to create mixed reality. And in that sense, it, um, it's more of technology that kind of blends or allows you to kind of switch seamlessly between the two. So it might be something like, you know, um, you might go to a virtual world to shop for IKEA furniture in a virtual IKEA store somewhere online. And then once you purchased it, you can actually virtually or switch over to the augmented reality view back to your home and kind of lay out and see where you might put your bed and your desk and things that you just purchased at IKEA um, that are technically be still being physically shipped, but might just appear in your room so you can start to plan for it. Oh, and actually, just to sum it up with, with that, extended reality is sort of a, an umbrella term that is trying to, it's used in a lot of uh, literature to kind of just be able to talk about all of these different types of virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality as one term. So extended reality is basically um, that way of kind of referring to all these different reality technologies that are popping up. And this is a little a little slide I wanted to include because I think it's very very reasonable at this point for people to say like why why should libraries care like what is, what is the application here for us and for education in general and I think for a lot of my life um, virtual reality was somewhat of a gimmick um, it wasn't really available in any you know mass market sense the equipment was expensive or it was very limited uh, and it's also been really heavily kind of based on the uh, the, the adoption of virtual reality gaming too has been a huge part of this. But I think that's changing. And I see that especially in my children and my children's friends and, and people of that age, grade school age, they have grown up with uh, low cost, very accessible virtual reality gear. And they no longer consider it something that's just a, a gaming tool. Uh, this is a, a, a picture I took at a science fair for my 10 year old son. And one of his classmates made this virtual teleporter and submitted it to the science fair. But the reason that he created it was sometimes, you know, his reason was sometimes you want to experience things you're learning about in class. And I hear that all the time. Uh, my five year, my seven year old um, had to do a, a session this semester on uh, the Titanic. And when she got done reading the passages, the first thing that she wanted to do, the first thing she asked me was, oh, can we tour the Titanic in virtual reality? And, you know, you can, you can, you can find uh, a kind of like a, a a 3D video that's made up of the various submersible footages that have been taken of the, you know, explorations of the wreck. I think this is going to become more and more important for libraries and for institutions of education to be able to provide this kind of content uh, for students who are going to be coming and experiencing it or expecting it. So switching gears. Um... We're gonna talk a little bit about the role of libraries and librarians in this technology. Um, I mean, a lot of times people have been using virtual reality to actually host sort of a technology event where you basically bring in a virtual reality headset um, and you know, run a program, kind of like Joe said, you know, take a tour of the, li uh, the Titanic, or in our case, we, we once did a, a tour of the Anne Frank House um, on our campus. But even before that, I think part of it is that, uh, like Joe said, this kind of technology is starting to become sort of everyday, um, everyday technology, like people are getting used to it. And in that sense, uh, we, we just wanted to cover some topics that we think are a concern for libraries. I shouldn't say concern, but things that uh, libraries and librarians should be aware of when we're, we start to talk about this virtual reality technology. One is content curation and evaluation. So as 3D scanning and 360 capture um, become a lot more available to consumers, um, one of the things is that you know, you're start, gonna start to have to deal with co digital content that's actually going to capture reality, right? You're, you're actually going to start getting 3D dimensional objects of sculpture, not just the pictures. Um, and on top of that, you know, there's a concern about quality and authority control. Like how, how do you kind of keep keep control over what kind of content is coming in, what's real, what's not real. Um, and in a sense that libraries and librarians are, are, and even archivists and museum curators are gonna have to sort of start practicing this digital curation. Um, Cause you're gonna have to deal with physical objects that are represented in reality, but are recorded in 
either a 3D scan or a three, 360 um, photo or even both, like a combination of a 3D scan and 360 capture. Um, this kind of thing, and I, I brought this in as a, a living portrait where there's technology out there that can even make the Mona Lisa start talking. And, you know, this is part of what, um, you know, you've heard of deep fake and other technologies that are, are doing similar things where on the fly, you, you no longer need a lot of um, sort of expertise to create these kinds of, um, I guess, content. But in general, like deep fake, you hear a lot with political ads and things like that. So what content is deserving of digital preservation and at what point is what's real and what's not real? I mean, technically deep fakes will kind of replace someone's face or actually take over someone's face in a digital image and basically make them talk or animate them um, and just follow a script. But at the same time, we have to consider like the context and the fact that, you know, these are being used in political debates or, or political ads and things like that. And actually do have a place in our, our history at this point. So at what point is Obama's speech and the deepfake speech part of history, part not part of history? What do we preserve? What don't we preserve? It, it's going to get harder and harder because some of the things that are that may start off as these digital representations might actually be part of sort of the an important part of the, the history in and of itself. Another part is cataloging. Um, as we start to create these 360 photos or three-dimensional objects. I mean, the, the content itself is richer. It's not just um, sort of a two-dimensional object or content that you're, you're kind of recreating. Um, I'm sorry, it kind of got cut off here, but the picture was of a banana and it had all the nutritional values floating around, but a visual re representation and augmented reality that also shows like the, um, the circles that kind of depict like the context and the, the size of each of those vitamins and sugars and things like that, so that you also have a visual representation. Um, and again, this is very different from sort of the, the cataloging or even just the nutritional label you might see on, a, on the side of a can. Um, I think in, in a way, in order to be able to accommodate and um, accommodate a lot of the different contexts that every object might be placed in, now that we can record a lot more at the same time, um, cataloging is going to have to start thinking about linked data environments where, you know, an object itself might have to on the fly be able to connect to other metadata out there, whether it's Wikidata, Library of Congress subject headings, or even, you know, um, other government data, anything that else out there that's available either through subscription or open linked data um, repositories that could provide additional metadata on the fly and be pulled by the user's request. Um, the data itself can be independent of the object. So the, the tricky part is that the NOAA data for weather might be totally recorded on, on a different day, but you may be in sort of a, a situation where you're, you're trying to figure out what the scenery looked like of a particular place at a historical event. And again, you may not have a picture of the actual, say, a lot of the Black Lives Matters protests, but you do have a picture of the street that it took place on. You do have a, a, a picture or a record of all the different people that might have been there. And then you might actually be able to kind of recreate a digital representation of what that protest might have looked like when all the protests were there, what the weather was like, what, you know, all the different conditions. Um, kind of like what you would see in the Star Trek holodeck that you always see on the next generation. User experience is another thing to consider. Um, I have an example of MeScan, and I know it's kind of a, a more of a checkout system for users to have on their phone. But the idea is that um, now you users can actually have sort of a portable virtual checkout desk on their phones. And with a camera, they can just scan the barcode. Um, you have to consider that a lot of the, the technology that's driving augmented reality and virtual reality isn't always um, sort of a, a big production. Some of this is technology that just makes simple things, everyday routine tasks, pretty simple. Um, and the idea there is that you can now have, um, there's possibilities for new user interfaces and new ways to interact with materials and even new ways to access information um, through our either phone 
in the future, you might have glasses and things like that. Um, and we also have to consider that there is technology that's starting to be represented through other sensory um, devices like hearing aids and things like that, that can actually uh, um, provide sort of augmented reality audio feedback for people who might be visually impaired, but they'd be able to see signs through sort of a, a connection between their hearing aid, the data connected with the, the mapping, all the types of points of interest that they might be passing by, and basically on the fly, be able to hear all of this as they go. And then finally, digital preservation. Um, this background image is of a project that I think it was the Holocaust Museum that was sort of recording this person and at the same time interviewing him through many, many questions over a two week period. And basically um, it's the, the setup or the studio is similar to what, you know, the matrix used to do all those special effects with people floating in the air and, you know, dodging bullets and things like that. But the idea was that they were recording him as he was answering these questions, one, to preserve his sort of um, movements and things like that as he was answering his nuances, his, his you know, um, hand gestures and facial expressions and things like that. And then what they did was that they were able to reproduce him as sort of a holographic projection in the museum. And I think nowadays they, they actually do make it available to even schools and things like that, where basically they made it so that it looks like he is sitting in front of you in a sort of a holographic projection. And based on the many questions and answers that he provided, he now can actually answer questions on the fly using a combination of artificial intelligence that kind of um, will take in the, the question that is being um, presented by a user and basically rehash all of the interview questions and all the content and things like that to recreate an answer and also recreate his physical gestures and physical sort of um, habits um, to make it look like he's actually responding to your questions in real time. Sorry. Oh. Now switching back, um, the main topic of our pre presentation is about our easy kit and our easy project. Um, that's short for the Empire State Immersive Experiences Project. And we first started off with the easy kit and taking all the things that we kind of talked about before about the roles of libraries and librarians, we wanted to come up with sort of a low cost kit that would allow libraries to easily provide a kit to their users that could be loanable um, to actually just start sort of a community driven sort of 360, 360 photography content. Um, I know it sounds like a, a simple thing. Um, we try to create a kit that was as easy as to use at the time as possible. And we decided on this Ricoh Theta 5 with uh, sort of a selfie. It was low profile stand is basically a a selfie stick with a, a stand at the bottom. We added this 3D spatial audio because we had uh, ambitions about like recording 3D audio. We had protective cases because we thought people would be going out and recording in the rain and all those, all sorts of stuff along with the user guide and uh, sort of a legal release template. But um, one, we did pick the, the Rico Theta because one, it was easy to use. It was a point, mainly a point and click camera. Um, and we did find that it, they had a commitment for, I think, two to three years support in their software. So we thought it was a safe bet to recommend to other libraries for purchase. Uh, but we, what we did find was that even with the kit, as more people used it, and we haven't actually opened it up to the public, it was mainly just for Winnie Lurk library members to kind of play around with and, and, and start to test out. Um, we noticed that in general, like we could get pretty good content just with the camera itself and the selfie stick tripod. And in most cases, that's all people took with them. Um, I mean, it was nice to be able to record 3D audio and things like that. And it would have been cool to have sort of a surround sound recording. But I, I think in the, at this point, we are more interested in the sort of recording the environment and sort of covering the, the 360 content that can be captured by everyday people. All right. That led us to create a space where we can start to store and collect all the content that we create with the kit. 
And that led us to work with uh, Winnie Lurk, Metro, as well as Winnie Lurk members, the volunteers who were, were volunteered for our task force uh, to combine our forces and basically come up with a design for a, um, a digital repository for 360 content. It's built on the archipelago or archipelago platform. Um, I believe, actually I might leave this to, to Joe to kind of explain the details. I, I can't remember exactly what the, the original platform is. Archipelago is a platform. Islandora. Free, oh, what was that? It, Islandora. Islandora. Islandora, 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 yeah. Um, and it's being developed by Metro and in collaboration with their developing their digital platform, they were nice enough to actually create our own customized repository that would um, handle 360 content. And so they did a lot of the development. Um, we worked with them to kind of create the, the actual website and the user interface. And we try to make it so that this will be developed by with America Metro Empire, wait, Empire Share ESLN. Sorry, I, I keep forgetting what that stands for. Empire State Library Network. Empire State Library Network. Okay. And then part of what we, we were hoping to do is to collect this content under a Creative Commons license so that it would be open and available for educational use by, for schools, community members. So we, we really want to, one, be able to load out the kit for free to library users, but also collect some of the content that they're willing to share in, the, in its raw format um, under a Creative Commons license to be stored and sort of donated as part of, you know, borrowing things, the kit for free um, to the Easy Digital Repository. And we decided on a Creative Commons attribute, uh, sure. non-commercial share-alike license. And at this point, you know, we yeah. wanted to include this slide because we really need to recognize the contributions of a huge number of librarians and, and, and other helpers who've, who've helped us along the way to get to this point. None of this would be possible without the support of Winnie Lurk, who has uh, funded most of the development, and Metro, who has been a fantastic development partner, and the Winnie Lurk Resource Sharing Committee, which has provided a ton of labor, essentially, to uh, assist us with this. So metadata librarians and people out gathering test data. And this is just some examples here on this slide, some of the things that we've gathered, some documentation that's been created. It, is, it has been a laborious process to create all of the pieces that need to kind of go into the back end to, to build this out. And I think at this point in the presentation, we're gonna take a real brief break and see if there is a question or two while we switch into the demo. Carrie? Right now there's nothing, so I'm just giving everyone a minute to okay. put something in. I just gave them a reminder to use the Q&A. Ken, I'm gonna share screen. I'm gonna switch with you. Okay. Hearing none, I'll assume that there's uh, no questions at this point. Oh, We're I have one. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, hang on. Okay. Okay, Dave is asking, and he might be, he said he might be um, jumping the gun. He's wondering what types of projects you're um, going to be working on, as you're working with as far as with the EASY project. And what kind of projects have you seen so far from the users of the kit? The, the submissions, the submissions so far have really been kind of internal to, to the Winnie Lurk committees and to the, the librarians who've been working on this. So, uh, we had we had a librarian from UB who went to Jordan and he was able to capture some content uh, from the Wadi Rum Desert from other locations. Uh, we had a librarian who's been out at here you can see Knox Farm State Park and she captured some some things there. I think we anticipated in the beginning that this would at least begin as kind of a regional and statewide project where a lot of the content would be related to New York State, but that's not has not been an, a limitation that we put in place. Um, you know, it is a little jump in the gun, I suppose. We, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how, how this uh, repository can be configured. And we can build out collections, and those collections could be scoped geographically, or they could be scoped by topic. So there's uh, a lot of options here at this point. And right now, it is still very early in the development. And so most of the content is kind of 
things that people were able to get to. You know, I'm on vacation and I'm going to capture something while I'm there. Um, Ken, can you repeat the name of the museum that used the hologram of the man in the chair? Um, this person had just missed the name of the museum and was curious because they wanted to be able to look that up after the presentation. Yes, uh, I believe the, the museum that did it was the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. I, I might not have the exact name, but I can, I know it got submitted into the, the question, so I will type in the answer once I copy and paste the, the actual name of the, the museum. I think but it was... Let, or do you remember, Joe? Yeah, I think it was, it was sponsored by the Shoah Foundation. Oh, that's right. The, yeah, the, the group that was backing it. Okay, another question is, could the digital repository also be used for non 360 content? Yes, yes it can. Um, uh, right now the repository is set up and the, probably the most pre prevalent feature is a, a, a browser plugin called Penelum. Penelum, I believe, was developed by MIT libraries, and it is a virtual reality-centric plugin. There's, uh, it's for displaying virtual reality content, and there are many like it. Google has one that they make available as well. This one's open source, and it works really well with Island Door Archipelago architectures, uh, but it can host other types of content. It can host flat files like PDFs and images. It can also host... Um, like a, a 3D model, like an STL file or an OBJ file. And that's one of the future uses we see for this is not just experiencing spaces, but also being able to interact with digital objects. So in a world where uh, archives and special collections may not be able to accept people in for visits, they may be able to digitize objects of, uh, that are in high demand and make them available to be interacted with through a, a VR environment. The, right now, Easy doesn't support that yet, but it, it certainly could. It's definitely part of like the toolbox. Can you say something about Google Cardboard? Is it a VR product? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, unfortunately, I think Google recently announced that it's, it's sort of moving away from Google, v Google Cardboard. It will still be around, but I think their, their development is limited at this point as they try to focus more on the newer more portable VR equipment. Yeah, I, th I think cardboard had a really important place in, in the kind of like the, this, this kind of modern revitalization for VR. It's, it's a couple years old now and the whole idea behind it was anybody could just put together a real simple VR kit. You know, the original kits were literally like punch out cardboard. You'd, you'd get it in the mail, you'd punch out the pieces and you'd, you'd fit the lenses in and your phone would do duty as, you know, the actual, um, uh, stereoscopic, you know, imagery, uh, it's very limited in what it can do today. And it has largely, I think, been replaced by low cost headsets that do a much better job and are affordable and have much, many fewer hassles than what cardboard has. Have you discussed the time staff needed to maintain a repository of the sort? We're, we're starting to talk about that too, but, um, and I think there was another question about, you know, about the, the other non-360 content, but I think that's kind of where I think Easy's main goal is to kind of link out to non-360 content. This is more to kind of create a more focused like 360 repository because the idea is that a even a location can have so many different objects that it can link to. And I think that's kind of what we're, we're you might see when in Joe's demo about once you add the, the, the 360 content, it's also possible to create these tours that we were hoping to create that will link out to either external URLs or in you know um, objects in the repository. But it's more like the, the glue that might connect a lot of this content. It doesn't necessarily have to be housed in our easy repository for all the external content. Okay, let's see here. Maybe take one more and then we'll move yeah, on. Yeah, I was gonna say there's one more question. All right. Um, so VR headsets like the Oculus Rift S and the Value Index are the type of headsets you are really aiming at using right now. I I would say no. Generally, um, the we what we focused on mostly are are the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest, which are the two lower cost headsets. The, the Oculus Go is probably as as inexpensive as $150, maybe $199. Uh, it's a uh, three degree of freedom 
headset. So it's somewhat limited, but for educational applications, I think it works really well. The next step up is the Oculus Quest, which is I think 350 or 400. Though all of these headsets are, are currently in such high demand that they're sold out pretty much everywhere and they're very expensive to buy right now. But um, that one is a really full featured headset with six degrees of freedom that would enable you to like physically explore virtual reality spaces. And that kind of thing didn't exist two years ago. There was no standalone set like that that could, that could you know, manage to do what it does. And two or three years from now, these headsets will be much less expensive. They'll be much smaller. They'll, they'll you know, the form factors will shrink. Um, the Rift that was mentioned, I think still requires a PC. And so you have to, you know, have a, a cable set up or wireless where you're connected to like a kind of more powerful PC that's doing a lot of the processing. My thought, my, my, my I'll, I'll see what Ken wants to add to this, but my thoughts are that an educational environment is better served by a standalone headset that doesn't require uh, expensive hardware to go along with it. And I would agree. I, I mean, that's kind of why Google Cardboard was so popular in the education field. Um, I think you guys are all set with questions. Yeah, we should okay. switch over to the demo. Um, oh, I was going to just mention before I forget, because this was in, in relation to the staff question. I meant to say that because it's so focused, it, it, we're trying to limit the, the projects first and ramp up um, expanding contributors. So for now, I think it's just going to be winning our members and slowly expand, you know, provide it for training for librarians and things like that. So to keep sort of the, the number of projects at a minimum to test this out, we are, we are sort of testing this out for the libraries or even library profession, you know, down to the, like what needs to be cataloged. So a lot of it's still in sort of the prototype phase that we're trying to test out so that we can expand it to a wider audience. All right, uh, like Ken said, uh, we're gonna do a, a demo here. I'm gonna walk us through the site as it exists today. Um, Ken mentioned it, this is uh, based on a institutional repository platform called Archipelago, which is a, a fork of the Island Dora repository. And it's using Drupal as its um, like front end. So those of you who've used Drupal will probably notice there's like toolbars here. Um, and because of the way I'm logged in, I have access to a, a couple other things that most users would not see. Right now we have essentially kind of three productivity workflows. We have a contributor workflow, a curator workflow, and then a tour builder workflow. And the contributor workflow would be the most generic one that pretty much everyone would be assigned. That enables you to upload imagery. And that's about it. You can uh, attribute a couple metadata elements, but for the most part, you're a contributor. You're just uploading, uploading content. The curator workflow or role, I guess might be a better way to describe it, uh, is able to do full enhancement of the metadata for everything that gets submitted. This is very much a kind of like librarian centric idea here where someone who knows what they're doing would come through afterwards and improve the metadata to make things more discoverable and describe them more appropriately. Uh, and then the third workflow is the tour builder workflow, which is used to enhance or to kind of annotate the existing panoramas, the imagery. It's also used to build navigation elements and we'll hopefully do a demo that works where we can move from one image to another image. Uh, this would be kind of how, how we would build like a tour of a space if you wanted to, to you know, create a tour of your library or of your campus or of your institution. Uh, this is the page itself right now as it exists. Uh, Ken mentioned it's uh, a beta. I think that's probably pretty fair. It might be just a little bit below beta at this point. There are some things that don't work as they should, but that's to be expected. Um, it features uh, tokenized searching up at the top here. And at the bottom there, we have some facet exploration where people can explore the content by media type, by location, by geography, and by subjects. Uh, these are very much in development here. It's, it's uh, very much trying to figure out how we will limit subjects or what subjects will present and, and, and how, how this kind of exploration will work. There's a lot of back and forth with the developers on how to do this. So I'm gonna go through the workflow for uh, uploading content and uh, I'm going to go to content or create and I'm gonna choose panorama. And I took a, a capture of my backyard a couple days ago. Uh, because of the pandemic, I don't have access to the camera kit right now. So I actually used my phone and most modern uh, cell phones are, are able to create a panorama image. 
through their camera. So this is a functional image, but it's not ideal. Uh, the resolution is much lower, but it'll serve for this purpose. So it's of my backyard. So we'll call it Joe's backyard. And I'm going to pick the file. And now the images that we work with are equirectangular JPEGs for the most part. And equirectangular is the, the, the same idea of a, a map projection, an equirectangular map projection. So the most common maps that we look at tend to be equirectangular. It's just taking a spherical geography and transforming it to be a flat two-dimensional geography. I gave it a description. And an address. We're using OpenStreetMaps for our mapping. So I will plug in my address. I spelled everything right. There it is. The creator. Currently, we're asking for creator in one field, but that's one of our upcoming changes. It'll be broken up into multiple first name, last name fields because there's kind of a debate about should people be putting in first name, last name, or last name, comma, first name. But for right now, it's last name, comma, first name. The date that I select that I took the image. And then the terms of service. And this is really important. I want to highlight this. All of this content is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share alike 4.0 license. This is probably the reason that this site exists. Uh, there are lots of ways that you can share virtual reality content through YouTube or through a huge number of like VR hosting platforms. But in many cases, the terms of use are not ideal for an educational environment. You may not have rights to remix these images. You may not have rights to use them in, in, in various ways. And you are very much contributing into a, a giant you know, multimedia platform. One of the risks here uh, for libraries is that Facebook and Microsoft, Apple, uh, Amazon are very quickly cornering the market, especially with regards to patents on VR and AR. And if libraries don't have some space here, it will quickly be kind of pushed out. Um, we, we, don't, we, we really didn't want to have any type of limitations on the licensing so that people could be free to use this in any way they needed to. I'm going to save that. And save one more time. And that object has been created. This is what it looks like. You can see here the geolocation, the geotags are pulled out of the image, so it's already placed me on a map. This is my backyard. Now, in a headset, if you were viewing this through uh, like a, an Oculus Go or whatever, you would be able to use your controller to blow this image up and actually look through the image, you know, through in, in, in the headset itself. So this can be used both on a flat screen. For, for students who might be working on something and they just they want to be able to kind of brow, like use the mouse to navigate, it can also be used in a headset. You can see the metadata that we captured there. It's very thin at this point. We do have a link here that we just added to download the original image. So the original image is, is stored separately from the metadata. All the metadata is stored in a JSON file. And you can see all of it here if you want to pour through all the gory details here. Uh, that includes the EXIF data. That's actually a separate file that gets pulled from the camera. So for those of you who are into photography, that's where uh, things like the aperture size and the focal length and all the descriptors about the camera itself are stored. Um, we want to capture that and hold on to that because uh, some people have told us that if you want to, you know, use this in post-production, it's really important to know the specifics and the geometry of the camera that was used to capture the original content. So we want to make sure one of our, our, our goals from the very beginning has been to preserve as much of the original data as possible, the original metadata and the original file. And so the, the file and the metadata are all stored separately. And when you make transformations, you never, you're never touching or modifying the original. Now I could search for Joe's backyard. It won't come up because this has not been published yet. So this is just the contributor workflow. We haven't actually published it. I'm going to kind of switch gears here now and say that now I'm going to take on the, the curator workflow. And you can see here there's a curate unplub, unpublished panoramas. Someone will come afterwards and they would find here's Joe's backyard in this list. And I'm going to edit that. And I'm going to click edit descriptive metadata. So most of this is most of what we see here on the first screen is what the contributor has already contributed, including the latitude and longitude from OpenStreetMaps, um, 
you know, city, all that kind of stuff, all those pieces, the, the, name, the name of the creator, local identifiers, institutional owners, these are fields that are not fully implemented yet, but at some point it will be a way to identify all of the, say, if you're using, if you're using content for a specific class, you know, uh, uh, or if, if you want some way to kind of gather up content that is related to a particular place or institution, that's what that field will be used for. We're gonna move on to the next step. And the next step is where we're able to add in subject terms. And so we have Wikidata subject terms and I'm gonna use backyard. And I'll add also in house since my house is pictured here. And I'm not a cataloger, so apologies to catalogers. I'm gonna go kind of fast on this. Uh, for, for Getty term labels, I'm gonna use exterior view. And you can see that these are um, auto-populated. So they're already connected to these data sources. This is what Ken was talking about earlier, this idea of, of linked data and using, you know, connecting these objects to linked data sources to expand their discoverability. Agents and roles. This is a, a kind of new piece that's being implemented and this would enable us to add Wikidata agents and roles. And like for instance, if we, if we were describing the Washington Arch in New York City, then we would say Stanford White was the architect. So this enables us to connect more metadata and more linked data sources to this. In this case, I do not have a Wikidata entry for my house, uh, so I'm gonna leave these blank. But if you were recording your library, you might, you might record something, like my library is named after E.H. Butler, who uh, made the donation to kind of create the library. So we might include E.H. Butler, who does have a Wikidata entry, and the role in his case would be um, uh, donated or donator, I'd have to look it up and see, but you're able to create these relationships uh, that better describe your object. And then Library of Congress subject headings, we made these non-required because non-catalogers struggle with this. Um, I'm just gonna use home for my Library of Congress subject heading. Obviously we would do, you know, more, or, you know, uh, someone would do a better job, a more thoughtful job here. I'm gonna move on to the next step. Collection membership, this is where we would add uh, a collection. Currently there are no collections in the system. They have to be defined in their own kind of taxonomy in the beginning. They could be anything. They could be garden tours of Western New York. They could be historical landmarks. Um, they're kind of a free form uh, element that's able to bind together collections that are related to each other. I'm gonna leave it blank for now and choose finish description. And here we're in the very last step and I'm gonna change our state from draft to published. And then say okay. Now, if it index quickly, if I search for Joe's backyard, I should find it in the repository and there it is. And there we have it. So this is now publicly available to view. So that's the second workflow. The third work workflow kind of ties them all together and uh, it's under create and I can't see what my, there we go, panorama tour. So in building a panorama tour and this tool is still you know, very much being worked on but we're gonna add multiple scenes and we're going to describe them a little bit. We're gonna add some points of reference into the scenes. So I'm gonna start with Joe's backyard. And I'm gonna select that scene. Oh, hold on. Try a different one. Hold on one second. This is the danger when doing a live tour. All right, here's another one uh, that I preloaded called St. Mark's Church. This is the church at the corner of our street where my kids play. Let me see if I can add in our other panorama as well, though. Let's grab one other one then. There we go, all right. So 
here's St. Mark's Church again, for whatever reason, it's not seeing my, the one I just uploaded, uh, but we'll soldier on. So this is a, a panorama that I took <laughs> as a backup a couple days ago. This is my kids riding bikes in the parking lot at the end of the street. And uh, we're gonna just describe this one. So here is the church. And I'm gonna create a hotspot on, on the uh, tour here. So I'll call this St. Mark's. And you can see here I have hotspot types. I've selected the location by clicking, and then I'm going to add a text hotspot type. And you see it adds this little annotation here. So the way we see this being used is if, if we had a faculty member who wanted to create a tour of churches in Buffalo, New York, or of historical landmarks, they could create like text, important text about specific elements in the building. And someone who was viewing this would then be able to click at the point at those and look at them and see the, that, that text pop up. Uh, at some point, we'd also like to have audio as a possibility here, but for right now, we're, we're starting with something, you know, a little bit simpler. So I might add a couple of these. I might, my kids go through this little chunk of woods back here. They call it the forest. So we'll add a hotspot for the forest. And then there's my son, Joe, eating ice cream. So we'll just call it little Joe. So you can see how easy it is to use this tool to add these little annotations here. The other thing the tool can do is it can link to other panoramas, which is why I really wanted to have two in here. So I'm gonna create another hotspot, but a not of type text of another panorama scene. And you can see here, because I added the Knox Farm State Park, I can link to that, hot, to that uh, panorama. So I'm gonna add that hotspot. So now we have a slightly different icon here. It shows the arrow pointing out instead of the I for information. And again, these are not finalized, but this would, this would enable me if in the VR environment to actually move to another hotspot. And because we wanna have navigation that goes two ways, I'm gonna switch over to the Knox Farm and I'm gonna pretend that somehow we can walk from the Knox Farm to the St. Mark's parking lot. And I'm gonna create a link back to St. Mark's. And I'm going to add that hotspot. So clicking here would go back into St. Mark's. Clicking in St. Mark's would come where we are here. Um, this obviously works better when you are moving smaller distances. So uh, you, you, it, within your own building, you might go from room to room to room to build a virtual tour or from building to building on a campus. The other thing that we're able to do that's currently not working as it should is we're able to set an initial scene orientation. This is really important when building a, a navigational element. You don't want people to go through a doorway and then suddenly be facing back the way they came or facing off at a strange angle. So you are able to say, I was coming into the scene this way, so I wanna set my initial orientation like this. It doesn't always work. Oftentimes when I go through the tours, the orientation kind of hasn't set or taken the way it's supposed to. So that's just an open development issue. I'm gonna go down here and I am going to move on to the next step. Oh, I get a bit tighter. We'll call it um, neighborhood tour. Just like with the individual panoramas, we have to describe the tours as well. So this is a different media type. It's not a panorama, it's a panorama tour. The description might be a walk through my neighborhood. The place, you typically would not use a street address here because uh, you're moving from one location to another. And so uh, the OpenStreetMaps helps us a lot. I can say Kenmore, New York, and pick that kind of larger geographical area rather than a specific street address. Same thing here, we need our, our subjects. We could pretend this is for a garden tour. So we'll pick garden tour related subjects here. No match there, we'll just go with exterior view. I think there's an Library of Congress garden tour. Yes, all right. We also have agents and roles. So again, if you wanted to describe something you know, particular to this, and you can add multiple sets of agents and roles here. So you can set up lots of different relationships. Oh, and I, got a, I forgot to put the date in.
Again, it can be part of a collection, just like the individual panoramas can. We don't have any collections, so we'll move on to the next step. This is an important part where um, the panoramas are a little different than the, the panoramas are a little different than the um, excuse me. The panorama tours are a little bit different than the panoramas in that they don't have a kind of thumbnail, so you have to pick one. So I I chose one already. I'll grab that, just the JPEG, and I'm saving this. And the very last step before we complete is to make this published. There we go. And let's do a search for tour, I think I called it. I'm going to refresh my screen here because it's misbehaving. And unfortunately, the, the tour is not displaying here. Again, the perils of, of a live demo. Uh, but I'll show a different one. Content, all content. Here we can see uh, a panorama that was created of the Japanese gardens by the uh, Buffalo Historical Museum. There's Ken walking. And here we have uh, the navigation in place where you can click on this to move to the next scene. And in this case, we only created the kind of a one way tour, but you can move back to the other scene. So obviously, the perils of, uh, you know, a brand new system, and we're still working out a lot of the bugs, but the, the tour functionality is, is functional and we really have a lot of other possibilities here to add on additional enrichment here including superimposing jpegs so that if you were doing say a tour of an art museum and you wanted to give additional information about the artist you could use those clickable elements in order to pop up more than just text but art, um, it, it video and images as well and that combined with uh, the navigation we think really makes it a kind of strong uh, possibility here for a lot of different educational uses and I'm gonna stop my share, and I think this is probably a really good time. I saw a lot of chat, so there's probably some questions. Okay, let's see here. Okay, the first question is, how long do you think this particular format or type of data will be used? And what might the next format be? I'm thinking about migration of files. Any thoughts about that? Hmm. Well, we're using, we're using JPEG EXIF. And I think part of it is that that's the most widely available one for most cameras that are providing 360 photography. Um, and I think that is sort of su supported in the, a lot of digital rep preservation and archival literature, but that, that is going to be the tricky part. Um, right now we're, we're kind of relying on JPEG EXIF because it provides a lot of the metadata that would allow people to recreate kind of what Joe said in his demo, the, a, a lot of it's going to be the metadata that's more important than the actual image itself, uh, because a lot of the image can be repla replaced by a new image of that same location if necessary, as long as we have all the metadata to, to figure out where, where that location was. Um, this is where I, it, it's tricky because I know we're used to kind of like migrating formats over and over, um, but I have a feeling that people, it, it's going to be more than it, making sure that content can migrate over. I know it's kind of uh, examples might, might be better once we get into them to kind of describe how this might work. But the idea is like, even now, like people are taking old black and white real films and converting them to, you know, HD resolution using artificial intelligence on to sort of recreate the image. Um, it's not an actual representation of real life, but it would be something that would be able to uh, convert like older 
mediums to a newer format without actually having to convert the digital object itself. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I don't know if this was the same, if somebody already answered this question, so I'll go with this. It says the functionality reminds me of the, I'm going to hope I'm saying this right, um, H5P virtual tour. Mm. or HSP virtual tour. Is this using the same technology? And someone said the site uses Penelum. So I guess yeah. that would be for your type of answer. Yeah, I've seen the H5P piece, which I want to say um, it's part, like you can use part of it for free maybe, but I, I'm not sure that the, all the functionality is for free. Um, this is, I think, more extensible than, than that is, um, but that's probably more a better question for the developer. Uh, it does use Penelum, and Penelum has a lot of different functionality that can kind of be rolled into it. But it, it, it does offer probably a pretty similar toolbox or, or set of tools to what to what uh, H5P has. Um, I don't think H5P can do, it can probably do a little more than, than uh, Easy can do right now, but I suspect we'll, we'll catch up to it relatively quickly. Let's see here. Next question is, since the project is now restricted to WinniLark, can you recommend other low-cost tools to create virtual tours of library buildings? Well, like I said, like the, the, the images we looked at today were mostly, a lot of them were taken with a, a phone, and I don't have a particularly fancy, it's just an Android phone. Um, most, most Android phones, especially the ones that use the Google camera app, have the ability to take a panorama. And those are lower resolution, but like Ken mentioned, if you can if you can manage to take one when there's nobody around, and if it's your building, you should be able to control that. You get reasonable imagery. Um, you can certainly host those things in a variety of places, including YouTube, but there won't be any type of uh, tool built in to to connect them. Like through the through the image itself, you might you might cleverly build a web page to link people from one to another to another. Um, I guess it's, it's, it's pretty easy to, to capture low quality imagery and pretty easy to host it if you don't mind it being part of a, a big media ecosystem and you don't mind the licensing not being probably what you want. But the navigation, you probably have to use something like H5P. And a lot of this project is because you, you either run into the low cost tool but proprietary content that doesn't allow you to do what you want to do but you can still view it or the other way, like the, the really nice content is, is stuck behind sort of a technology, whether it's Oculus or um, by, you know, basically any of those virtual headsets have their own proprietary format that's being developed. And so we're trying to create a repository that at least creates a place for raw content to be readily available because anyone could take the, the, objects that we are making available through the Creative Commons license and refine it and make it available for even more advanced applications. Um, for us, it's, it's more about like giving people a way to record regional and local data and history. Um, I, we're we're kind of limiting it only to Winnie Lurk only because we're trying to like focus on refining the workflow, making sure it works okay uh, and making sure it's easy to use for the regular user, because that's that's our main concern is that we want this to be community driven in, in the long run. And for now, I think we're just limiting it to the um, Winnie Lurk members, but there's nothing to stop us from reaching out to us other regional um, or New York State um, consortiums too. Because originally the idea was that we would be able to have like a, a student in Buffalo who would be able to like watch or go for a star walk in was it Plattsburgh? New Paltz, <laughs> I forgot. Or, or or New North, Paltz, yeah. yeah. Um, I forgot there's there's a, a, a place in, in New York State that's the darkest place in New York State where one of the SUNYs is, and they have an astronomy um, program that would probably go out on works and field trips. And basically, if we could record that, it would bring that field trip to other parts of New York State. And that's, that's sort of our, our driving force for a lot of the project. And the other thing to be concerned about, there's a Google tool that it may still exist. I think it was called Poly. P O L Y that did some of this as well, but especially with Google, you got to be really careful. Uh, I mean, they pull the plug on these development tools all the time, and then it's all gone. So we wanted to make sure that uh, you know, we, we want to drive people into a kind of solution like that, where they build something and then Google decides this isn't really profitable and they 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 yank it, and you don't get your data back; it's just gone. At least with with Easy, 
your data is preserved and you could always download all of your images. Okay, and um, Paul uh, just linked his virtual tour. Um, it's in the um, chat right now. I'm not gonna click it because I don't know if I'll lose everything if I do, but for anyone else who wants check to it out later, yeah. try that out later and check that out later. But I think we're caught up with questions. You guys can go to the last part. You're muted, Ken. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, you're good. Sorry, I was in the middle of switching or sharing the screen so I couldn't unmute myself right away. Um, so this is moving on to the sort of showing some examples. Um, part of the roles of libraries and librarians in virtual reality and extended reality, but also where the easy repository might, might play a role. Um, I think I'm gonna start off with just, hopefully this works. Just showing you a quick video. The audio, the audio doesn't come through, but this is this is how the Mandalorian was is shot in this in this VR soundstage, which is incredible. The whole thing is one giant LED panel. And they are able to um, control, like on the seven mission. Oh, there we go. You got it. The audio visuals, yeah, created in pre-production, and can be on the screen within 24 hours of, of being final. It's incredibly impressive when you first walk out there because it completely surrounds your peripheral vision, and you really quickly forget that you're indoors and you're not out on some planet's surface. It feels like a real three-dimensional environment surrounding you because it is a three-dimensional environment. You can allow your key creatives to all make decisions together so that the shots are captured entirely in camera, which allows for a better performance. And what was so exciting about this is by bringing those people together, things started to click and we started to realize, well, let's not just do green screen and interactive light. If we're going to design the whole set and game engine ahead of time, maybe we could have some in-camera effects. Everything in the volume is designed to both light the actors and to be a background that we can directly photograph. So you end up with real-time final pixels in camera. If you look at visual effects heavy films, you've got a film set and then it's going to go to post and it's going to get the world put in. Here we're considering all of that at the same time and how do we create a background and foreground that live together on the volume harmoniously. When we started to play with the idea of using Unreal Engine for virtual production, that's one of the things that uh, Richard and John started to embrace is that you've got this very dynamic world where you can have randomization of things and find the happy accident that gives you the perfect shot. Being able to see the actors point at things and see what they're looking at was pretty transformative. It gave everybody context with the added benefit that if you want to move a mountain from there to there, you can do it instantly. You could switch between the Iceland location to the desert location, all within the same day of shooting. The ability to shoot a 10 hour dawn is extraordinary. To shoot any sequence where you say, oh, this world's not quite right, let's just move it a little bit. An extraordinary number of benefits and advantages for shooting in that environment. It's mind blowing what that tool is. What you see is really what you get. And that's something that really means a lot to filmmakers, especially those who have worked with a more traditional approach in the past. Shots of character in a vehicle traveling through a complex environment. It's always very difficult to do believably on stage. LED screens are a wonderful solution to that problem because what you're doing is you're taking this technique of image-based lighting that we've been using in computer graphics for years and use it to light a subject. And then we would do shoots where we would texture map real lit surfaces onto our game engine geo. And so the camera could move anywhere. We would do interiors like Werner Herzog's office. And then you started doing things like building sets into it, having half a spaceship with reflective surfaces. And so it became exciting because by the end of the season, it was like, let's start designing sets around what this could do well. 
just like the good old days. With Star Wars, we're building on a rich legacy of innovation and getting to partner with John Favreau to make his ambitious vision a reality, it's really a game changer for filmmaking. So, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but, and did it work okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm always nervous about having it. Oh, now I have to find my presentation. Ah, sorry. I'm in full screen. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the case where, you know, the, the physical and the virtual are kind of layered together. Um, and that probably does have implications for libraries. Obviously, we're not going to be building these giant hangars with LED screens, but um, certainly we could, you know, there may come a day where we can build rooms that may work in this way, where the exterior of the room uses a projection system in order to generate an environment that people might want to, you know, tour or recreate. Uh, and the, the amazing thing here is that, you know, the, the, the use of a game engine, like they're, they're using a gaming engine in order to build out components and change them on the fly. And it, it, for them, it was a cost saving measure. They saved a ton of money by filming in this way uh, than they would have normally used through, through traditional you know, film production. So here in the bottom, you can see at the bottom of the screen, that's the VR interface that the director uses when they are scouting the locations. They'll build the location in the game engine and then the director will say, well, that won't work. So I wanna, I wanna make the lighting a little bit darker. And then he goes into VR and sees what his changes will look like in VR. And then they can collaborate. It's not just the director, it's the lighting specialist and the, you know, all the other people are involved and they're, they're using these tools in VR together. So it's amazing. And sorry about that. Just got lost a couple of windows that <laughs> when you're juggling these. Um, again, it, it, it's pretty clear on how like a film production could use the, the 360 or easy content in, in the future sometime. Um, but I also feel like as that that technology improves, that's something that eventually might be something at a library or a museum, just a room full of um, the same kind of smell set up at a smaller scale that allows people to visit or even basically that that's more of the realistic holodeck from Star Trek where people can actually immerse themselves in an actual physical location without ever having to leave the building. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier about the Anne Frank House virtual reality tour, this was something that was provided um, through the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam, and they developed a free virtual tour that's available on a lot of the virtual reality platforms. On our campus, we um, did it for an event, and basically we provided Oculus Go's, the, the standalone headsets, and I think we had three or four going at the same time to allow students to kind of visit the Anne Frank house. Um, but one of the interesting things is that the tour itself, um, the tour of the house is something that doesn't exist in reality anymore. And what I mean by that is that um, the Anne Frank house, when they developed this application, they actually recreated, uh, I think it was, um, that they had a documentary or a film that was being produced at the same time. So they, a lot of the film production recreated the rooms and objects in each room. And then they went through and scanned everything so that they, they could make sure that they had sort of a, a reference point for all the physical objects. And then they recreated the Anne Frank house with all of the objects in place as best as they could um, based on the, the historical record. So it's interesting that even if I bought a ticket to Amsterdam and went to the Anne Frank house um, and the museum itself, I can't see any of this in the virtual reality because um, none of the furniture is in the actual house anymore, nor is any of the objects or photographs and things that were pinned to the wall or desks and lamps and things like that. So the idea is that you can actually create something, a, a, a totally different experience as well using virtual reality in this kind of setting. And 
basically provide kind of going back to like being able to visit the Titanic, which is actually under underwater at this point to actually have kids visit a pristine version of the Titanic so they can actually see what it looked like before. I'm going to let Joe take this one on, but this is sort of an example of something more uh, directly related to library workflow. So this is, this is Shell VR, and Shell VR was a technology developed by Bo Brinkman, who was a computer scientist from the University of Miami. Um, and it is a library reshelving system. And as a tech services guy, I, I, I would love to have something like this. Um, the way this worked was every book, every spine label had a kind of visual identifier, very similar to a QR code. Uh, and they could use an application that would you know, read the shelves and identify misshelved or missing books because Shelf AR was a catalog aware. So it, we knew when a title should be on the shelf, it wasn't on the shelf. And it knew where things should be in, in order, you know, through, through the shelf list. Uh, and this is a great example to show because it would have been a fantastic technology for technical services departments and librarians and libraries all over the world to use. Uh, and it was going to be brought to market. This was developed in the University of Miami in one of their kind of technology incubators and they promoted it to become a saleable service. And it was immediately shut down by Amazon who claimed prior art patents and shut the whole thing down. And this is what I mean when, when I say li if libraries don't get some skin in the game, then there won't be anything left. The, the big technology companies are already creating this technology and using it and locking it away uh, behind patents. And so unfortunately, if you visit Shell VR, they have a website that's still up, but it says that the project was forced to be closed because they were, they were unable to kind of marketize this. I'm sure something similar could be developed, but you'd have to run the risk of kind of, you know, uh, of dealing with a technology company that might try to put a, uh, put a stop to that. That being said, there's probably other ways to do this. You know, um, one of the things that was talked about, or we'll, we'll talk about a little bit is LIDAR, which is uh, used in self-driving cars in order to identify objects in the road. And it's extremely sensitive or can be extremely sensitive. And I, I always thought we well, could probably build something very similar to Shell VR just based on the height of your books. You know, your catalog knows how tall everything should be through the mark record. And so you could have like a, little shelf AR or like a little robot with a, with a LIDAR array that just scanned your shelves and looked to make sure that the books were as tall as they should be. And if it found a gap or if it found a book that was too short, it would be able to tell that a book was missing that should have been there where there should be something that's 23 centimeters and instead it's, you know, it's only 18 centimeters. This doesn't exist obviously, but I think this is certainly within the realm of possibility. This could be developed. It could be a tool that, that could be built out that uh, would be like an automated shelf reading system, you know, just a, like a little camera array that I, I like to think of it as like a lonely little Roomba that's maybe vacuuming up and it's got like a camera array on a pole and it's as it's vacuuming through your shelves it's also shelf reading using the, the height of the books as its kind of metric to judge and then it would file a report in the morning someone would come in and they would get a you know a printout of you know the 150 or 200 books that it thinks probably were misshelved or were missing um, I think that's the possibility or the promise for this kind of technology And sorry, I, I kind of included this in as, as sort of an example of what Amazon's doing right now as sort of a warehouse like traffic camera where basically for social distancing purposes, they have strategically placed screens that uh, show people as they're walking by sort of whether they're maintaining social distancing or not. Um, but again, th this is where the, the technology is where it can pick up on things like this on the fly. Um, a lot of things, even a few years ago, that relied on even QR codes or some kind of barcode can now just rely on the image itself to, to provide feedback and it, create the augmented reality sort of platform. And I know it was mentioned earlier, but I think we were going to talk about LiDAR in the sense that um, LiDAR isn't just being used to, to navigate cars um, for automatic driving cars, but um, it's being used in anthropology and archaeology to do surveys using drones and things like that to actually just survey the, the land using, I think, the, the LIDAR is mounted onto the drone and facing down and basically just covers miles and miles of, of land that used to have 
to require teams to go into the actual um, out into the field and you know trudge through mud and, and actually physically see all these um, landscapes now you can use a drone and in like a fraction of the time map out like vast cities um, I, I think there's already been a lot of benefits from this um, but I know Joe has a friend that that's an anthropologist who's who has actually started using this as part of his research data and one yeah. on one hand it, it it's more like well go ahead Joe he he he, he you know um, he used to go out on digs quite quite routinely and and now almost all of it's done through ground penetrating radar and lidar scans and it's vastly more efficient so he really spends all of his time overlaying layers of different radar data onto maps and identifying potential targets for other teams to go in and dig so they're able to use use the data to uh, kind of put this kind of augmented reality layer on top of the regular topology maps and identify where a cistern is and you know if there's a cistern there it's buried underground it's good it's likely that there was probably some you know some other things there that they want to investigate so he's really spending his time layering and identifying patterns that probably point to you know useful useful dig sites and it it is vastly more efficient than than the way that they used to to operate and there's been a couple of stories in the news about entire incan cities that have been discovered there was just an article a couple of days ago about an entire roman settlement that was just mapped completely using lidar and ground penetrating radar and sort of variation on this um Basically, this is an example of being able to recreate a 3D model based on sort of the, the mathematics of two-dimensional photographs, that it, it, you can collect a collection of two-dimensional photographs and then recreate the three-dimensional as long as you have coverage of all the different angles. And I, I believe in some cases it can fill in the gaps based on um, sort of artificial intelligence programs that would or machine learning programs is, is more like it. Like they know what a barn should look like. So if there's a corner missing, they can probably figure out, you know, this is where the, the walls would meet and intersect and probably kind of figure out the texture of the wood um, approximately just to recreate the actual object itself. Um, again, I, I think easy is, is more relatable to this where even our panoramas could be used in this to provide the data needed to provide more accurate representations in a 3D model in the future. Yeah, one of the things we talked about kind of early on was the possibility of including like a like a marker stone, you know, like that when you captured something, it, you might be like it's a six inch sphere that might go somewhere that would help a computer program later on to rebuild the geometry. So if it knows that that's that little disk is six inches in diameter, then it's able to extrapolate other dimensions as well. And again, we're I don't know how useful that would be to a photogrammetry you know, process. We're just trying to anticipate ways that this data might be used a long time from now and we, we, we don't want to look back and think like oh if only we had done you know this or that it, things would be so much more useful but uh, those kinds of things i think are, are are definitely definitely on top of our mind when we're when we're working on this project and then i'm not going to play the the video itself but these are examples of how VR is, is able to trick people basically into thinking they're in a much vast open area. Um, these were two examples where basically it tricks you into thinking that you're going down a hall, but you're actually just confined within say a 20 by 20 square. And it, it's basically tricking you by the door you go out and remapping the hallways every single time you go out a door so that it kind of wraps around its original space and connects you to another door that will connect and replace the room that, that was already there. Um, same with this other virtual reality feels like an infinite hallway. Basically it's sort of sem two semicircles that are providing a wall that people can touch to make it feel like they're, they're constantly walking, but in the virtual reality, they're, they're actually going straight and they think they're kind of like endlessly following a hallway and each of the gaps is basically a break in the hallway where they, they can go down another hallway. And then for a little bit, it, it provides you with like a straight way and then it, it lets you turn again another corner to basically trick people into thinking. And again, uh, this is ma mainly like for libraries, it, it, this kind of technology as it's, it's refined 
will allow us to have sort of these in in house spaces to provide virtual experiences um, in a much smaller scale. And the mythical maze. Probably, yeah. <laughs> probably many of us have seen stuff like this. I know, like my kids have lots of they're like coloring books that basically can do this. But this is a program, a summer reading program, uh, in the UK. And I think it's still being run. It's been run for several years. That's basically using augmented reality as a way to get kids into libraries and navigating through libraries. And so as they read, they uncover clues that are images and they, they use an app on their phone and they have to hunt through the shelves. It's kind of like, it's like a maze they have to go through. Uh, and there are different visual cues that the app picks up through the camera of the phone in order to present like another part of the story. So it'll animate a creature, it'll pop out of a wall or like a hole open up, all, all different things, all different effects can be created. But the idea is that the library itself is kind of like, you know, the walls of the maze and then the app using different visual cues is able to kind of push kids around through it. And I think this has applications in, in all kinds of libraries, uh, especially with regards to navigation. And there are several different technologies that exist. HP bought up one called Erasma, and um, there, there's, there's many different uh, services that use, they can use lots of different things. They can use uh, imagery or like a QR code, a kind of a ge ge geometric object in order to trigger um, pop-up information in an augmented reality environment. And I think for libraries, the use there is navigation. Uh, you could help people to navigate through a space by using these like dynamically assigned uh, images that would say, okay, turn right here, go, go left there, you know. Uh, and you'd, you'd need to have a kind of a destination loaded into the software, that would be a book. So it probably would be a shelving location that you'd be using. And then uh, the trick here as always is, most people who come into your building will not have this app installed. You know, they won't have what they need already running. And just like QR codes, I think QR codes really took off in utility once every camera app on every cell phone was able to just open them. When you had to have your, a separate QR code reader on your phone, it was likely that a lot of people just wouldn't have one or didn't understand that technology. And so they, they weren't as useful. But now, every, every, pretty much every cell phone camera can just read a QR code and, and, and pop up whatever the, the information is. AR navigation needs something very similar. It needs a standard that can be recognized by mobile devices that we can then use to build applications out of. Okay, and I'm going to start going through. There's some stuff in the chat and some stuff in the Q&A. Sure. So um, let's see here. Okay, so I'm just going to read Dave has a few things. So this is amazing, fun, and cool. You guys are great. Just to back up to check my understanding, <laughs> what metadata do you have access to when adding metadata to the panoramas? Do you see a value to link to Google Maps, or can you have access to LC or OCLC linked data? Well, I think that's part of this project is figuring that out. I, I, there isn't, at least we haven't found any, I mean, Library of Congress does not have guidelines on how to catalog 3D, 360 photography. Because um, it's, it's really a combination of things. Like it's the photo itself, it's the location, it's, it's all sorts of things that are, are coming up that we're, we're wa working through. Um, that's part of why we want to ramp this up is that we want to slowly expand more librarians and have them collaborate with us so that we can get more feedback before it's ready for the public. Um, in, in a way, we're not sure what metadata. We're using OpenStreetMaps for locations, um, mainly because that's the, that's the most open as well as um, it, it, there's a lot of flexibility, more than Google Maps, I believe. Um, but at the same time, we, do, we have run into weird things where it's almost too flexible and it's sort of the Wikipedia of you know map mapping software where we've run into like oddball things that other people have contributed, but may not work for a cataloging environment. Um, yeah, like the locality field in OpenStreetMaps is frequently misused, and so locality really should it's it's if you read the the, the like the specs, it really should be used for like un, unmarked train stations and things like that for like regions that don't have any other identifier. But it gets used a lot inappropriately by people who are well-intentioned and contributing to the project. And then it shows up in easy as like this odd, unexpected, you know, data point. So 
we are definitely still kind of working through through what what pieces to include the Wikidata uh, data or metadata I think is is really easy to use and flexible and I think more and more institutions are, are contributing into Wikidata and it's it's growing um, but I think Ken's exactly right we're still kind of learning what pieces should be in there and need to be in there shout out to Allison on our team that that is our main cataloger yes Allison <laughs> who's done a lot of the Buffalo County Public yeah. Library has done a ton of work in our like metadata guidelines and developing that stuff and th th those that we could probably share I think what we're probably going to do is we're going to email everybody at the end of this presentation or maybe tomorrow or the day after uh, just to as a way to get their feedback if if people are interested in being involved you know um, we definitely like Ken said we need more we need more external feedback and ideas to, to help with things. Does anybody have any more questions for Joe and Ken? Um, I can either can either put it in the Q&A or I can even unmute you if you wanna be in any part of a discussion. I guess raise your hand would be how I would see it. Our timing is excellent. I know it's you're exactly exactly two thirty. So um, on behalf of Sunila, I don't see any other questions or anything coming in. So on behalf of Sunila, I want to thank um, Ken and Joe from Buff State for presenting the Easy Project, and they will, like they said, be emailing you. And I included in the links in um, the chat. Um, some right to the direct SE page and to some of the information for Winnie Lark if you're looking to find content with them then and you both are getting all your praise in the chats <laughs> and uh, I want to thank everyone for um, attending today. Thank you all for coming too. Thank you.